There's no better feeling, whether it's filmmaking, video making, game making, than being like, I have an idea. I'm going to go in this room for a little bit, and then I'm going to come out, and I'm going to give you something, and I'm going to ask you to press play on it. On the 62nd episode of Passion in Progress, founder and CEO of Viewer Ready, JJ Castillo. Viewer Ready at this point specializes in augmented reality and virtual reality. And a couple weeks ago, I had the chance of stopping by their headquarters and trying a few of their games. Coming from a guy that grew up with normal Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and N64, getting to experience these kind of games with a virtual headset is mind-blowing. So if you're curious about the life of a developer and somebody that's making products for VR and AR, and I think this new thing called XR, get strapped in because this is the episode for you. And if you do like this podcast, all I ask in return is that you refer this show to a friend. If you like this episode or any of the other episodes, please let somebody know about the podcast. It really helps with getting the word out there on the show. So without further ado, let's get into the 62nd episode of Passion in Progress with founder and CEO of Viewer Ready, JJ Castillo. What is up, Merce Nation? Javier Mercedes here for yet again another Passion in Progress show where we talk to inspiring individuals and hopefully through hearing their stories, you too are motivated to go out and pursue your passions as well. Today on the show, we have VR specialist JJ Castillo of Viewer Ready. Hello. Who, I just realized that Viewer Ready, if you abbreviate it, stands for VR. I'm assuming that's not by no, chance. <laughs> it's totally not coincidental by any means. But also at the same time, we kind of, um, I'm going to stub our toe on it. You know, like there are, there were some companies here in town that were in the 80s and the 70s were like really big media companies and they had names like Teleprint. <laughs> you know? and, and then there was a company here in town when I used to do video production full time. They were called like 1080. Yeah. And, uh, and it, with a little P on the back. Right, right. Out. But at a, at a certain point, you know, the technology is going to make your name sound outdated. outdated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wouldn't say that that's the case with you already. But as we've moved forward, we have you already, we do a lot with virtual reality, obviously. We do a lot with, you know, kind of flat media as well. But we're also doing a lot more with augmented reality. So that's AR. And then so what the industry is really trying to push is this new term called XR, which is supposed to be kind of like the house for all things like immersive. It's not really taken off yet. We, mm-hmm. we're, we're kind of like, uh, you know, kids without a home as far as names. But yes, View Ready is uh, there's a VR in there. There's a little bit of a nod to like, you know, Ready Player One. And then, you know, just the idea the viewer ready. It, it works on a lot of levels. Give a overview of what you guys do here. We started just being, you know, a group of uh, a group of folks that, you know, were really fascinated with virtual reality and, uh, you know, just wanted to play in the space uh, any way we could. Uh, we were lucky when we started the company back in around 2015, I kind of met a bunch of folks at a game jam and we ended up putting a small team together and uh, we were just kind of messing around. And, and our, the first thing we did was we made a baseball kind of simulator that you break stuff with baseballs is really simple. You're just at bat. There's a field full of like jars, windows, plates, and you just kind of break them like a carnival game. And uh, that was like a really huge hit when the Vive came out because there was like 12 games when the Vive came out on Steam and ours was just like a free demo. So it shot up to like 90,000 downloads within the first year just because it was free. Long story short, that led us to getting attention from a bunch of brands and companies. So Anheuser-Busch reached out and said, hey, you know, we'd love to do a sport experience for Madison Square Garden. Uh, so we ended up doing a, a basketball thing for the Knicks and MSG, which then led us to doing a two-player version um, for uh, the NBA All-Star Weekend. And so that kind of, uh, we kind of fell into that. And then that kind of um, really formed what the company was going to be, which was for a while we were doing a lot of kind of venue installation, brand activation using VR. Uh, since then, we've done more stuff like that for Dell and South by Southwest. And most recently, we did a big augmented reality app for uh, Tiff's Treats Cookie Delivery, which if you're in the Texas or surrounding Texas areas, you definitely know about those yummy, yummy cookies. They're so gooey. Right. And <laughs> so delicious. Sounds like from our discussion beforehand, you do kind of both. You get to play and do your passion projects while also doing client work. But it also seems like the client work is also a passion. Well, the client, I mean, I mean, it's always, no matter what I'm working on, I'm always putting like full force and creativity and I really want to be cool. When I was doing uh, video work for, you know, a decade here in Austin, I, uh, one of my big clients was the Austin and San Antonio boat show. And it was like, it's an easy check, you know, it's just like <laughs> cut together a 15, 30 second commercial. Come on down to the boat show. Uh, but, uh, after a while, you know, I started doing the VOs and producing a bunch more of it. But the thing is, is 
I could just easily sleepwalk through those videos and just collect a check. But I find myself like doing a bunch of stuff in After Effects and like really like doing tricks with the letterbox going up and down. And there's no reason I need to do it, but I have uh, I have a I have a obsession um, with just quality and content. And no matter how big or small the project is, or if it's just like a joke around video that's just for friends and stuff, like I, I can't, it, I, I will obsess over it. So, uh, you know, put a lot of detail into things. Would you say that a lot of the people that are in the VR space were filmmakers or are still filmmakers in some way or like photography there's, in general? There, there's a good group of us that came over. A lot of them have stayed in passive 360 or passive VR. And uh, I kind of hit the ceiling on that in the first six months. Um, so what story with me was, was I was working at Rooster Teeth. Um, I'd, I'd been there for about three years. And, you know, I'd been doing filmmaking and stuff my entire 20s. I just turned 30. Um, and one of my friends had let me try his DK2, which was the Oculus development kit. And um, like, it was like a holy religious experience when I put it on. And I just thought like, this is all I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, and just kind of wax romantic about like platforms and, and, and mediums is that I didn't go to college or anything. So for me, it's always just been about like just talent and my whole approach to life is like, I just don't want to be bored and I just want to do, if I can find ways to make money doing the things that actually like fascinate me, that's, that's, that's the goal. You know, I might not be able to buy a yacht anytime soon, but as long as I can survive and eat food and go out and have drinks and still do whatever I want, that's, that's kind of the sweet spot for me. As far as the birth of a medium, I never thought I'd be alive at the birth of a medium. So I, I, I'd read books about the early days of TV, radio and film about how like these Oscar Wildes and these Stanley Kubricks and that, uh, all these folks who had like no, they didn't go to film school. There wasn't a film school then you know um, especially in like the Lumiere brother days the early days of film um, people just had an interest for it and then those guys end up becoming like the leaders the thought leaders the the pioneers um, and it's just so funny because you know everyone when filmmaking first was came about everyone was just filming plays they were like this is what movies are it's just us filming plays and you know you see a little bit of that with VR and stuff where you see a lot of guys who came from 2D video games mobile video games and then you know they got some dev kits and they're like oh let's just port these ideas to VR and i and you know some of them were successful and some people really like them but i still think we're at that stage where we're we're still filming plays and um i think there's a new color that none of us are like thinking about like it's just we're in a box and it's a really weird time with locomotions. How do you move around? What's the UX? What's the what's like the input like? So, um, kind of to go back to all that, the, the the reason it was it was it was an easy decision for me to jump from a career a decade longer, if not longer, career in filmmaking where I had clout and people knew who I was to throw literally all of that away and then kind of come into the world of development and video game engines was, you know, it was really daunting, but you know, um, at the same time, there's some, I think, I think there's, um, I think there's value to outsiders coming in and shaking things up. Um, you know, like in the film world, you'd have some guy who'd never done film, but he's like, I got an idea for a movie. And you're like, Oh, this guy thinks he's going to make a movie. And then he makes it and you're like, wow, this is totally new and different. And it's totally shaking things up. And no one took you seriously because you didn't come from this world. And now we're all taking you super seriously. So, Going back to that vein, there are a lot of filmmakers that have made the transition to VR, not nearly as many into interactive. You still see a lot running around with 360 cameras and trying to kind of use old filmmaking ways and bringing it into immersive media. And I think that's really exciting, but I also don't think that, I think that the 360 video craze is already kind of dying out. Um, it's always going to be a thing, but if you just look at the views on YouTube from some of these huge projects, um, you know, they're, they're not nearly that as big as you think they would be. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a good core of us, especially here in Austin that, uh, that have made the transition. JJ, you're a very interesting guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also all over the place. I feel like I could say like two words and then you would have a, such an amazing story about like, <laughs> let's talk clouds. And you're like, well, let me tell you about this. <laughs> they're intangible. <laughs> I have a film background as well. I am really curious as to what was your brain <laughs> developing your first game? Like, where's the framing of the eyeballs? Like, how does all of that tie into it? To kind of, I called me out on like the filmmaking background and VR stuff. Like a lot of my VR dev friends, um, and I'm very happy that I've been in the scene long enough and that I've had enough successes that I'm not just that like kid or not a kid, but I'm not that guy who just kind of jumped in the scene who thinks he's doing something. I've like earned enough uh, kind of respect from my peers from, you know, getting these big projects and stuff that I've been now, I'm on the board of VR Austin with the guys from, you know, Alchemy and Phaserlock. These guys that were like heroes to me when we first started out in the scene a while back. But, uh, 
It's uh, the one thing that they always call me out on is that I'm always finding ways to do interesting stuff with cameras. And it might not, camera systems might not be people's priority when they're making games, but there's a part of me that's always going to be, you know, a cameraman. Um, so I'm always trying to find ways to do interesting things. So for instance, the HTC Vive uh, had a webcam stuck on the front of, the, uh, of it. And it was, it was in case you needed to hit pause and see what was in your room real quick and to have that safety of like being able to look out. So when we did the NBA thing, I thought like, you know, we can use this in the game. Um, so what we did is, is we patched into the webcam. So what there's two things that we did with it is that we sent everyone a video of their highlights, which is kind of actually a way of data collection. But when you're working with Anheuser Busch, you know, that's what they're paying for. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so people would put their email in while they were waiting in line. And after they got done playing, they get like an eight megabyte MP4 email to them that would show them their VR POV, like, but in on the in the like picture in picture and the glass in the corner of the video would also be the webcam POV. So it was kind of like this hardcore Henry looking thing where you saw your hands moving around and you could see your friends cheering you on in real life all inside the highlight video. And then we also took that camera feed in and put it in the video game. So when you're sitting on the Madison Square Garden free throw line, if you look at the Jumbotron or the TV screens, you see your webcam awesome. footage and you can see your friends turning on inside VR. Um, and then as the thing, what you just saw, we showed you our magic leap experience. And there's, you know, there's the, obviously the augmented reality view of being able to look at this car that you're making drive all over the floor that doesn't really exist. And then the fact that there's a secondary camera POV showing you what the car sees um, kind of like GTA on your wrist. So sometimes, you know, when there's certain uh, obstacles, it might be best to look from above, but sometimes it's a real hard, sharp turn. So it makes sense to be looking kind of like on your wrist. Um, and then I showed you the trick that we were doing. Um, we're putting a 360 photo as the skybox of the room that you're in. So it looks like the car is actually driving in the environment and really it's just kind of a little trick that we're doing to your brain. Uh, and then with the, 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 the baseball VR game that I just showed you, it's still in development right now. Um, a lot of the uh, thought and uh, development has been into making an entire broadcast camera system. So it looks like you're watching an MLB game on ESPN or it looks like you're watching um, you know, some sort of broadcast uh, program versus a lot of times VR games, you know, they don't put that much thought into like the experience for people not in the game and watching on the couch or watching on Twitch. So a lot of times in VR games, the standard output is what the VR POV is. So it's a lot of like looking down, looking up. It's it's not very comfortable to watch if you're someone watching on the couch or on, on the internet. So for us, it's really important in the future to start making these experiences that really look like a cool video game and, you know, um, have really robust uh, camera systems. So, yeah, that, that's kind of the goal. It's interesting to me that your game development depends not only on not only upon the person playing the game, but how people view the game as it's being played. Because it seems like you brought up Twitch a lot there in, right. in the in the concept. Do you think there's the whole groundswell of getting VR like way, way, way in the mainstream is part of a whole bunch of people being a part of the experience that right. aren't actually experiencing R it? <laughs> right, right. No, no. You know, I think that's definitely it. And, you know, just to when, we, when I first started in VR and I was, you know, telling people, I remember like the jump from playing with a DK2 with a Xbox controller and thinking like, this is amazing, like doing flight sims and driving sims felt great. Um, but the moment that the vibe came out and they were like, yeah, you have 15 by 15 feet. It tracks your hands, it tracks your head. You can roll around on the ground and it'll know where, where you are. And that just like blew, uh, uh, just blew my mind. What I've realized is in order to make things pop, you, you really need to reach out to people who might not have access to the hardware. And I guess I got, uh, the point I was making is that I remember going to the valley. So like, like I, my dad was like a shrimpo captain. My great, my grandfather was a shrimpo captain, like all in South, South Texas. Like that's the world we come from. Um, so I'm always telling people like when I'm in Tokyo or like on panels with like, you know, like Satya Nadella, Microsoft CEO of, uh, uh, I'm like, I'm not supposed to be here. Like, <laughs> I'm like a, I'm like a fisherman, <laughs> fisherman's son. Uh, but, but I remember going down the Port Isabel, which is like one of the last towns before you hit the end of Texas, um, to hang out with a bunch of my relatives. And I brought an Oculus Rift 
down there, and I was like, man, this is gonna blow their minds because um, they're not, you know, they're fisher co- like fish community. Uh, so I went down there, and I was like, my older nephews and stuff were like, oh, they were kind of into it, whatever. But it was like my young uh, nieces and nephews that were like anywhere between seven and eleven. Um, we're obsessed. And then they kept asking me like, do you have job simulator? Do you have super hot? Do you have rich, rich? They (laughs) they knew the titles. And I was like, how do you know the titles, the games? And they were like, Oh, uh, Jack septic, Jack septic eye or blah, blah. They started naming YouTubers. And, um, so when we first started it, when I first started in VR, I, I would post stuff and I would see a bunch of naysayers and you know the Reddit gaming forums and on Twitter, and they'd be like, "Yo, I've been playing video games my whole life. Like, I don't want to stand up and play video games. I just want to chill out when I get home." And I like I I would tell these guys, and they're like late to twenties and mid thirties. I'd be like, "Hey, man, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but these games aren't for you. Like, you're <laughs> like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. These this is for the next generation. This is for people when they play video games. They're they're gonna want to move around. They're gonna, they're gonna want to spin around. We used to always make jokes that." Uh, in the future when VR games are more mainstream, um, right now you'll see a guy, like the joke is you'll see kind of like a neckbeard looking, you know, out of shape guy walk into an event and you'll be like, oh, that guy looks like a gamer, you know? Mm-hmm. But then we'd always say in the future, you're going to see these guys with like massive forearms and wow, like real, so and then be like, oh, that guy must be a gamer. Like mm-hmm. that guy's in shape. Uh, and so I'm 35 now. And like my whole thing is like, I want to, I got to stay in shape. I got to make sure my back's like, okay. Cause like as technology gets better, like I want to be able to play all these games. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want to be aged out. Uh, so that's that's definitely motivation for like kind of staying in shape. I think it's I think it's going to be an interesting kind of future. It's already starting to trickle down with the release of the Oculus Quest. You know, it used to be such a high bar to play VR. You needed a eight hundred dollar headset and then a fifteen hundred dollar computer to run it, uh, which is always so heartbreaking whenever you're doing demos and stuff. And some dad is there showing his kids they're having a great time. He's like, "Hey, how do I get one of these in my house?" And you're like, well, "You got like twenty five hundred dollars to like just sink in a in a machine." But now the Oculus Quest has come out and it's four hundred bucks. And we all keep referring it to as the Nintendo Switch of VR. It's 400 bones and, you know, it doesn't need a computer. And obviously it's when I try to educate people on it, it's, I say it's like a VR PC is like having an arcade cabinet at your house. And then having a quest is like playing that game on a, on a Game Boy, you know? That's awesome. uh, and it's great. It's just, you know, you're going to lose shadows. You're going to lose like graphic fidelity and stuff. But if like our game you just played is super cartoon and simplified, it's, it's going to play fine versus if you have a game that's like super realistic on the, on the, on the computer and has shadows and reflections, it's not going to look great. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about your user development. Because when I had the headset on, it seems like you were analyzing like, oh, how does he, can he find that thing that needs to be unlocked for the next thing to happen? Yeah. I, like, it seems like a lot of game development is that. When you're making the game, you have to make sure that the person that's playing it actually does the things that you intended, or maybe not. It's so funny you say that because you can kind of, in development, you can get kind of in um, a tunnel. You get like this kind of tunnel vision where you just go like, okay, you for this next uh, for this to, to uh, function, you know, you, the player goes A, B, C, right, and then you get so used to that being the only options because that's how you made the game, right? Mm-hmm. And so you just think everyone's going to have that same kind of thought process, and then you go do demos, and you see someone go instead of A, B, C, they go A, Q, <laughs> J, L, and you're like, what is happening? But <laughs> They can. Sh- you'll learn so much from playtest. It's super important because sometimes you're like, "Oh, it's done. The game's done," and then you realize, like, "No, we need more flags. We need more direction. We need more kind of notifications. People are missing these things that are super obvious to us." So I remember one of the first playtests we ever did. It was it was for Pitch Hit. It was at South by Southwest Gaming, like in 2015. And the whole thing was like there was a bucket that hung in the air next to you, and you'd grab the baseball and you'd throw it up at, in the air at yourself. And you'd hit the ball and try to break stuff. And I watched a kid for like five to 10 minutes just play catch with the bucket. You know, <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? But if it's interesting. <laughs> right, right, right. But yeah, so, so sometimes people will show you things that you're like, that's awful. Or you'll go like, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then like, you know, the, 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 the bucket would have a bunch of baseballs in it for you to grab. And then we would see kids like just swing the baseball bat under the buckets and make all the balls go. And, and uh, so yeah, it, play testing is very important and it's, it's something you should do, but uh, it's, it's, it's always going to show you it's just like screening a movie, you know, afterwards people will say, uh, oh, well, who did that? You're like, oh, well, it was the butler. And they're like, oh, well, it wasn't 
that wasn't really obvious. And you're like, oh, okay, well now we need like a throwaway line or we need something. Um, I always tell people that coming from filmmaking is, I feel like, and specifically, not, not filmmaking as well, but just being an editor for 10 years. Being an editor knowing like that's too much sound, that's seven like that's seven le- like layers of audio. If we bring it down to three, it's way more focused. Um, sometimes I feel like developers and even filmmakers just think like it's not good enough. Like more, more, keep adding more, and then sometimes it gets less focused. So I feel like I that's been one of my biggest strengths as an editor slash filmmaker, more so indie filmmaker is that sometimes you're on set and you're like, we've got three hours and we have eight shots. Oh, and it's, I love that. <laughs> and it's not going to happen. Uh, I always sum it up as like, which arm are we going to cut off that we can still, that will still like make the story make sense that like, which, what can we sacrifice right now? Or how can we adapt to these shots and merge them together? So there's always a lot of kind of like run and gun, figuring stuff out on, on, on set. And uh, I feel that happens in development all the time. You know, whenever you've got either a big play test or, you know, you have, an event you're trying to show off your game and you're going okay well instead of having all the sounds be particular like let's edit them all as one file and then we'll figure it out later and just you know just be, being being able to adapt is uh is really important in pretty much any kind of production i love that analogy of the time constraint because it happens all the all time, the time. <laughs> all the time i i remember like his shoots never end early they mm-hmm. always go late. They <laughs> always go late. Famous last words. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and I remember when I was a filmmaker in my 20s and there was this band and I, I called off this whole shoot because I knew they weren't in it to win it because they were trying to hire me. because I Respect. Yeah, th- they tried to hire me to do a bunch of, because uh, I'd done a bunch of cool stuff and, and, and for bands that they knew of. And uh, they were like, hey, we want to do this music video. And I was like, okay, cool. And there's going to be like a whole thing. We're shooting it like at a school. There's going to be like a playground shoot. And then there's, we're going to be doing some performance and then also some actor stuff. And, uh, and then a couple, like, uh, a couple weeks before, one of the guys in the band reached out to me. And they're like, so it's also so-and-so's birthday that, night, that day. So like his girlfriend like, was going to take us all camping. Is there any way like the shoot's going to end early so we can like go to this like birthday camping thing? And I was just like, I'm not doing this video. <laughs> like I'm not doing this video. Like if I'm going to carry all this equipment around, we're going to do this thing. Like we're going to go late, man. Like it never ends early. I, just, I walked away. Cause I was like, you're obviously not in this to win it. Like, and that band's not around anymore. So, I mean, that just goes to show you. I get the sense that you have, you take a lot of integrity with any job that you take on. I mean, I think so. You're only on this planet once, right? So it's like, you know, make your time count. And uh, like, I love having a good kytel of work. Uh, that's what I call it. Like, especially like in the film world is, you know, anytime I would do a new project in film, I'd always run into a funk in the edit or in the pre-production. And as a, you know, to motivator, I'd go back and watch kind of my older projects and you start to get like, you know, it, it, it gives you a bunch of pride. I was talking to a bunch of developers about it last night who, and I was saying, like, like they were saying that, like, maybe they weren't so happy with their newest game or they don't know how they feel about things. And I was like, look, you're never going to like the project you're working on right now until you're working on the next project. And that's just how it is. Like, there's so many times where I've worked, like, I've been working on a music video or a, a commercial and I'm in the edit and whatever. I'm like, oh, this is shit. Like, this is, this is awful. This is so bad. And then I'll go watch a, my previous project and I'll be like look I was in the right I was in the zone when I made this project <laughs> and then you know I'll move on to my next project and watch the project that I was just hating on and be like I was in the zone when I you know <laughs> when I made this so like it's it's sometimes you're just too close to it because there's something about especially with film um is like you can't update it there's not a patch for it like it's not a game right like as soon as you hit export as soon as you hit upload on YouTube and sh- you hit share on Twitter or Facebook like it's done. Like you can't ever go back. You know that it could have been 20 different edits. You know, that shot could have been shorter. You could have used the second take of the car hitting the boxes that, you know, but you know, like, and you don't know why you didn't use it, but like, you're always going to have all these different versions in your head right after you finish the project. So sometimes it's nice to let time go, let life happen, be freaking out about your next project. And then you go back and you look at it and you realize like you knocked it out of the park. Um, but yeah, that's the one thing about film. It's just so, so scary is that like when it's, when you put it out there, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Can you explain uh, to people that aren't familiar with VR some of, of the natural hiccups that come with right now and in the time period that we're at? Because I know a lot of what you were saying before was the polygons and like really dumbing down the graphics so things could render fast enough. Sure. What, are, what are some of the, I because what I like I, I loved hearing that kind of stuff right. before actually putting on the headset and then I, like playing it because you get more of the backstory and like sure. what's what's happened just to get to the point of me looking at what you the product that you've made you know right a lot of right now is you know just keeping things realistic as far as like texture and also just keeping things in scope and uh, as far as the game you're never gonna finish and that's why when we made our first game pitch hit. Um, just that kind of fun baseball uh, simulator, uh, just batting and stuff. We kept it real simple. It was like, you're just hitting stuff. There's a couple different levels. There's a couple different versions. There's a couple ways to pitch. There's a different couple, couple of different ways to bat. But it was super simple. And, you know, there was like two or three of us working on it. And we had a lot of friends at the time that were one or two developers. And they're like, oh, I'm going to make Halo in VR. And I'd be like, you're, you're not, though. Like, <laughs> you're, you're, you're going to start, and then you're never going to finish. Um, it was similar to guys whenever VR was popping around, you'd see them at meetups, and they'd give you cards. And you'd be like, so what are you doing? And they're like, oh, we're going we're gonna to be the YouTube of VR. And I was like like, you know, or we're going to be the YouTube of 360 video. And there's so many startups that they really like, they really focus on one thing and, and you just want to tell them like, it's really cool that you're doing that. But it, once Google and, and like the YouTubes and the Facebook start to want to jump on that train, it's literally just a few lines of code into their platform and they have your entire product like in their platform. So that, that's, that's the, that's, that's, that's one of the, the, the pitfalls of, uh, of that kind of, you know, saying you're going to do this one thing. Great. But moving back to like game development and like the, what are the issues and what are the things is you just got to keep scope. And I think that that's another thing that I'm really good at from coming from independent filmmaking is that I can take a thousand dollars and make it look like it's a $10,000 video or, you know, three grand, and make it look like it's twenty thousand dollar video but i also like don't write projects that i know we can't make happen whether it's a short film a commercial or music video whatever i always write the treatment based on locations uh vehicles props actors that i know that we have access to or that we could acquire here in town um whereas i've known a lot of filmmakers when i in, in my early days that you know when they write a script they'd write this like the fountain you know they'd write this like <laughs> something like uh like the matrix or 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 lord of the rings and i'd be like this is an awesome idea but like like you know we're waiters and at kirby lane like how <laughs> how, are, how are you gonna make this happen um so that's the other thing is just keep scope realistic um know what you're keeping what you're capable of what your team um and then instead of trying to make this you know multi-world multi-dimensional like epic you know make something that's like really kind of small but is but is fun and clever. Um, and I always think about one of the times I'd got, I was doing some videos for Rooster Teeth and we had like X amount of time to shoot this video and it was just kind of this recap video and it was using Barbara, one of their personalities. And I just said like, let's just put ourselves in the conference room. Like let's never leave this conference room and let's just see like, how funny like how like out like how 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 great can we make a, a episode that never leaves this room and like ended up being this like time travel thing where she like travels to the beginning of the episode but it's all <laughs> using like one location so mm -hmm. so sometimes i feel like not having a, a blank check or having all the uh all the tools in the toolbox sometimes um really can create something kind of great i think like m night Shyamalan movies like his best movies are the ones where they didn't give him a bunch of money like the sixth sense and unbreakable and even um like uh the one he did with uh switch or the one um that he did with james mcavoy before glass but like they're so great because there's not a lot of money so he's doing really interesting things with the camera and there's something super small and focused about it versus when you give someone all the options then they like they're, they they don't they pull out all the stops and it's too much you know so that that's how i feel about it just keep it keep the scope realistic yeah one of my favorite from M. and I Shyamalan is the speaking of just keeping it to one room is the elevator one I think it's called devil right, uh, right, the, right. that that one and it's a super simple concept like even when you read the description on Amazon it's like six people or whoever amount of people get onto an elevator right. and then like one of them is the devil and you're like man that's a great concept for a movie and then it just like the whole movie takes place in an elevator right so <laughs> then you're like you know it's super you, you latch onto these characters you're invested you know mm-hmm 
that's for developers, but for people that want to enjoy the product, what mm. what can you tell people that haven't experienced or people like in my situation where I've like I put on a headset once, right. but I didn't really know what went into the back end because sure. I think in one of the I follow you on Twitter and I think one of the things I like is that um, there's a whole bunch of different uh, people in the community where just like you were saying there's like you can see the people that just put the 2d image and then you can like move around in like a 2 d -er image there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then uh, if I strap on your game <clears throat> I'm walking around your office, like getting on my hands and knees, like trying to see into a parking garage right. to make this car thing go. Right. And you're adapting to the environment. Sure. Uh, can you talk about some of the things that go into the development that are just some of the enjoyments of the VR experience, but for people that like don't develop? Right. Well, so I guess, I mean, it starts with an idea, right? Um, like everything always starts with an idea and you build out from there. I, I don't know why I'm thinking about John DeBont when he did Speed 2, which is an awful. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> You're like, how did you get there? Didn't know we were going there. <laughs> I don't know. It's one of my favorite, like, cause like, so Speed 1's great and Twister is great. <laughs> and then John DeBont did Speed 2, which was God awful. But the, the, the funny story about Twist, uh, about Speed 2 is that he had the idea while he was working on Twister like what if like wouldn't it be cool to see like a, a big cruise ship just hit land and keep going through and like so he had that visualization he's like i just want to make that happen and then so he built the movie around that visual so kind of saying it starts off with an idea so he starts off with you know with the with the game that we made for magic leap uh it uh, that you played the the nitro sandbox like that was us just saying like what can we do that utilizes the hand tracking and can do some really cool picture and picture ar stuff and then so that was kind of where the idea came from you know where you turn the key there's a virtual key just an augmented key and hanging in the air and you turn it with your real hand and it starts the car we just really wanted to show off a lot of the tools that the magic leap launched with you know they also have eye tracking and they'll mesh the room and stuff so you know that that's that's kind of where it comes in and then while you're you know writing it and as you're de uh, designing the level and stuff then you start to think about like you know what's 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 like the user situation going to be like and it, and then so like going to our baseball game the very first one we ever made was super simple and this is how we would sell ourselves to um big brands and events and, and venues is we would say like we make the games that you don't need a tutorial for like basketball you just use your triggers when you, when you squeeze the triggers your hands are either open or they close when you grab a basketball you squeeze it when you throw the basketball you let go of the trigger you let go of the basketball and that's it like I, uh, and moms and grandparents, like I was, I, one of my favorite memories is being in New Orleans during Mardi Gras during the NBA All Star Weekend, and watching this like, uh, like, like this kind of like, herb. I think it was a rapper actually. I think it was like this like cool rapper guy, and he was like talking up a big game, like, oh, I'm gonna kick ass, like just watch me. And he he ended up going getting paired with like a soccer mom with a purse. She like played the game with the pur with her purse <laughs> still on her arm, and she like like beat him like <laughs> like by like at least five points or something and then afterwards he was like nah like my, nah my controller was like broken you know like, or, like or, or whatever but like that was the whole thing is that it was super simple and then with our baseball the first simulator it was you know your hand turns into your controller turns into a bat here's a baseball you know what to do um and then so we you know it was really big in vr arcades and stuff because one of the big things is when you go to VR arcades or you go to like venues and there's a VR experience, you don't want to watch someone spend two or three minutes, you know, doing a tutorial or God forbid, if you're at a VR arcade, maybe five to 10 minutes into the game, you just started realizing how the mechanics and everything work and they're already kicking you out because the next guy in line, which is very different than the baseball game we just showed you. The baseball game we just showed you, uh, Totally Baseball, which is going to replace Pitch Hit. If you've bought in Pitch Hit, our original game, one day you'll wake up and it'll just be called Totally Baseball and it'll be a whole brand new game. And it's our way of saying like, thank you to the people that kind of support us in the early times. Um, but uh, that game, it's definitely designed for VR players. Um, there's multiple uh, inputs. There's buttons you have to press to run the bases. There's buttons to press to, you know, pitch the ball. There's buttons to bring up a menu. Like, and then it becomes, that's why there's a, a tutorial. So, um, so that's a little bit different. It's, uh, it's one of those things where when we've been doing play tests with two different groups, we've been doing play tests with people that 
don't have VR and see how well, the, how well they do. And then we've been doing play tests with people who definitely have VR and like know what it's like to use buttons. And cause those are the, those are the games that do really well for the most part. Eh, it goes back and forth. Like you have onward and Pavlov and all these shooter games that have like inventory systems and backpacks and yada, yada, yada. And they like the VR players are super into them cause they play VR all the time. And they know how to work everything. But then you also have games like beat saber that are like, you know, just a total phenomenon where you, your controllers just turn into lightsabers and you hit, you know, boxes to the beat of a song um, and that's been a really great thing like whether or not you like Beat Saber or, or, or not it's, it's, it's huge because like PlayStation VR has completely co-opted it and then so did Oculus and everyone's treating Beat Saber now like it's like a Grand Theft Auto title but it was an indie title it was it was just an indie dev group and now there's PlayStation commercials like pushing Beat Saber alongside their PSVR commercials for Borderlands and Skyrim so you you, you see people learn a lot of lessons you know um you, you, I, I I get mad when the the manufacturers the, the, the people that make the headsets throw a bunch of money at a, a, a studio because it has a name and it's got cred versus they've never done anything VR before. So you see a lot of ports of like, you know, hey, here's Angry Birds and, you know, an AR or VR, which, which is fun. But I think the thing is like, so you can see, you can, you can compare it to like Steam and Oculus. Like Oculus is, 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 is definitely throwing money at, at, at games like Assassin's Creed and these titles that people know and they're going to bring them into VR and they're going to be exclusives in Oculus. Whereas Valve and Steam, on the other hand, are more about like the indie developers, like these little indie games, which, you know, are pushing the envelope. They're like, they're, they're, they're definitely like, they're showing you things that you've never thought of before. They're showing you locomotion methods. They're showing you ways to approach games that you've never thought of before. That, that the AAA uh, studios will then rip off at some point. I mean, like, <laughs> right. I mean, right. I mean, like, like, like look at the Marvel movies, yeah, right? Yeah. Like the Marvel movies are great movies, but the directors that they're getting to direct them are like guys that did movies like, um, cop car and, uh, just like, you know, like these, for the most part, like these like indie movies and like the star Wars things like Gareth Edwards, like who did, uh, monsters, you know, did rogue one and stuff is like, it's so funny that when filmmakers are so super snooty and they're like, oh, I hate bo like popcorn movies. And you're like, well, where do you think they're getting these directors from? Like, where do you think they're like they're finding these directors to make these these big blockbuster movies is like, you know, they're graduating from indies. So it, it, it's a little bit like that. But I, I'm 100 percent sure that you're going to see a lot of that. You're going to see a lot of indie developers making really cool features, functions, ideas, and then you'll see those co-opted by, um, by, by, by the AAA companies. It reminds me of a documentary I, I helped work on called like, uh, I think it was, it wasn't kind of like behind the music, but it was all about, uh, just kind of musicians. And it was either Erica Badu or Elvis Costello said, you know, um, there's always the people that are, there's there, there's the artist that invents it. And then there's the artist and then the people who steal it and then make money with it. <laughs> Uh, I think it's like a parallel to um, if you are the first to market, you can you can kind of have that that coast for a little bit, right? But it's almost like the second and third iterations of whatever that product was, right. That ends up like engulfing everything else. Yeah, see, and with that, like I'm really curious to see how totally baseball is going to do because one of the things I told you beforehand is there are no besides tennis and ping pong, which are very like kind of simple to develop. There are no full fledged sports in VR, you know, and there's some there are some AAA Oculus titles that are called like VR sports that look beautiful, that look like, wow, this looks like really, really great AAA game. But game wise, you're just at the free throw line while guys are trying to block you and you can either you can either shoot or you can pass to someone and then they'll shoot. Um, and it's just that over and over and over again. So it's a game on rails. Um, I, there's nothing like anaerobic aerobic that really lets you play the full, full sport, um, that I've yet to see. So for us, you know, creating an entire AI system so you can, you can play the whole sport against an AI team. And there's another, we have a, a, a version, a, a, a mode where you can sit in the announcer booth and watch the two AI teams play against each other, and then you can be the announcer or control the camera system. Uh, so and and actually like cut to like wide shot, follow this player. <laughs> so you're like you're like directing the game, which mm -hmm. turns into a whole other thing. 
Um, I had an idea a while back of doing like, cause I used to shoot cameras at like ACL and fun, fun, fun fest. I used to like one of the camera operators for the, for the musicians. And I was always playing with the idea of like coming up with something for Lollapalooza or ACL where you're in a VR headset and you're, you have this fake like cardboard camera with a focus ring and your goal is to like try to you're like watching like the Rubo gamblers or some punk band that like moves around too much and like you have like a target system where you have to like where you have to like you have to like focus and like and zoom in and and you're like you're in the pit and people are getting in your ways and the game is like trying to keep the guy in camera there's a genre there. there, oh, there oh, people, I know. people would buy that. That's what I'm saying. It's like coming, not coming from gaming, you start thinking really differently. Mm-hmm. And, and you start coming up with games that no one ever thought would be an actual enjoyable game. You know, whether it's like Goat Simulator or these games that like one of the biggest games on uh, in VR was uh, Euro Truck Simulator, Euro Truck Driver. And I remember in the early days, I'd see these photos of these guys that would stick like cereal boxes and a fan in front of them so they could stick their arm out the window and then feel the air coming while they were like driving these trucks in VR and like little things like that the little immersion like the little bit of air and stuff like it's all real that stuff like really does like you know trick your brain a bit you took the leap from filmmaking into uh VR how has it been doing client work your own work and all that other stuff, running a business, doing VR. Going from being someone who was always in the creative department at most of his uh, jobs, uh, you know, whether I was at Rooster Teeth or ad agencies and, you know, usually running all things video and editing. It's been a big change being the boss. Uh, You know, I'm so used to like just being paid well to go into a room and just throw ideas out and try to tell Gatorade and Scion like what kind of ideas would be cool for like a Rooster Teeth, you know, video and stuff. Um, and I love that stuff, you know? Um, so it's been real, it's, it's worth it though, because no matter who you're working for, when you don't, when you aren't the boss, you're always accommodating them and you always end up you always end up sacrificing a bit of your end product for them. There's always the edit you made versus the edit that gets released. Um, So there is the greatest thing about being the boss this time around is that if everyone is like, well, you know, we all think the the truck should be red. You have the ability to go like, I know you guys, you guys think that, but I want it to be blue. So it's, it's going to be blue, but (laughs) you know, and, and so it's nice to be that guy when you've never been, when you've not, been that guy a lot in your filmmaking life, you know, and you've always had to, that's what, well, I always tell people like whenever people are having a hard time or like they're pushing your buttons or, you know, they don't agree creatively. I say like, it's really important. You got to have your own passion project on the side. Like you got to have your own thing you're doing at your house. Like whenever I was working for clients, I always had like a music video or a short or something I was working on that I could go home, really work on and know that no one was going to tweak it, that I had full control over it and, you know, helps you go to sleep at night. Uh, with that said though, I'm not in this to be like a, a power, you know, power hungry asshole. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a creative guy through and through. I surround myself with creative people. I'm all for, you know, writing and directing and, and producing and coming up with the vision and saying, this is how it starts. This is how it ends. And this is what we're trying to accomplish. But I'm all for being proven wrong along the way. You know, like if anyone in my company um, or that I work with is, is, is like, well, I think it's this. Um, I would say, well, just, you know, just show me. Um, my biggest thing of working with collaborators is like, I don't like surprises. And the reason I did so well at Rooster Teeth is that I've known editors and developers that are like this way where you're like, I need you to do this. And then you'll come back and you're like, let me, let me see it. And they're like, so I was thinking about it and I thought like this might be way better. So I did this instead. And you're like, you can't like now that you've done that, that doesn't mesh well with what that guy's working on because you just made a call on your own, you know? So I don't like surprises like that. And the reason that I did well at Rooster Teeth is that like I would be doing an edit and then like one of my higher ups would be like, okay, so edit this. And then I would say, I, I was thinking about doing it more like this and like this. And they'd be like, no, just do it like this. And then what I would do is, is I would do it their way. And then I would find a time to also do my edit. And then so when, my, when the big bosses would come in and look at the edits, I'd say, so here's the way you guys asked for it. And then they'd be like, oh, I don't know, it's kind of working. I'd be like, I also have this version that is like some stuff. And I tried some stuff out, musics and sound effect wise. I'd be like, oh, let's see it. And I'd play it and they'd be like, I like this a lot better. Let's just go with your version. So the, the way to do it, if you're ever in a spot like that, is to do what they told you, but also do the other one if you can. Um, don't just do your version because that could throw off the whole project if you're not talking to people. So that that's the one thing. And, and, and 
I honestly, after the first year of being, I hate calling myself a CEO, you know, <laughs> like, like I, I, it's so douchey. And my friends who have known me my whole life, I'm like, oh, it's so douchey. Like, yeah, 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 it is douchey. And I'm like, it, it, someone has to do it. Um, and so, and I, I feel like I've done a pretty good job since we've been around since 2015. And, you know, we're completely bootstrapped and we don't have any investment money. Um, so that, that's, that's been really great. But after my first year of being the boss, um, I completely like... I completely forgave every boss and CEO, like not in reach out to them or anything, but <laughs> in my head, I was like, no bad, no bad feelings anymore. Because there are times where you're sitting on your computer on the edit bay on the weekend at 11 o'clock and you're just waiting for this response. Like, do we put this in? Do we not put this in? Are we going with this edit? Like, which version do I upload? I'm waiting for my boss to get back to me and he doesn't get back to you. And then Monday you have to explain it to him. He's like, oh, I was super busy. And you're like, you ass like that. You just like, you ruined my weekend or my time. You know, you, you weren't, you weren't thinking about me. You weren't accommodating me. And then you do it. And then when you're the boss, you come in on Monday and someone's like, Hey, I was waiting for this email. And you're like, Oh man, like I was underslept or I was working on this or phone was off or I was at an event or something. And then you just realize like, it's not personal. It's just sometimes it happens. Um, so like I said, like retroactively I've gone and like relinquished any kind of resentment <laughs> or anything I've had for any other boss or CEO. Cause I realized at the end of the day, like we're all just like, for the most part, most of us are just, you know, we're just trying our best. How big is the scene in Austin for VR, like viewer ready and just uh, VR in general? And then like America, like where, where does Austin sit in that whole scope of things? Well, it, to kind of like show you kind of how it started and how small um, the, the group was originally was, you know, I'd left Rooster Teeth in like 2015 and I was kind of living off my severance and I knew I wanted to work in VR, but I didn't know like to what capacity and I wasn't, I wasn't developing or, or coding at the time. I was coming from filmmaking. So I was doing a lot of stitching with photos and video. Um, I was doing, I started kind of figure learning and teaching myself kind of blender and 3d animations and stuff like that. Um, and there were times where I was thought like, man, I'm changing the world. And then, <laughs> and, 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 and then there were times where like, you know, I would just be in my boxers at my house going like, am I doing anything right now? Like, am I, am I, am I, am I actually, do, is this going to lead to anything or am I just spinning my wheels and I feel cool? Uh, but so what I would do was there was this website that was trying to be the 360 video uh, of the YouTube of 360 video that is not around anymore because YouTube started doing the 360 video, but they were called Vrideo, V-R-I-D-E-O, and they were around for maybe a year, maybe two. Um, and that they were like the only place early on that you could house 360 video on and watch it on, on the internet. So I would just take all these early early renders and projects that I was working on and I would just put them on Vrideo and, uh, you know, no big deal. And then I got this email out of nowhere from Oculus. And they were like, hey, we're having our big convention, Oculus Connect 2. Um, it's the second one we've ever had. The first one they had was real small. This one was like bigger because they had just been, you know, they, this was after they'd been kind of bought by Facebook. So um, that's when I realized the, 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 the pool of talent was super shallow is that if I'm just this guy in, in Austin just uploading these videos and Oculus is reaching out to me going, hey, we like what you do. If you can find a way to get down to LA, we'd love to give you this $500 badge for free. Um, and then, so I went and it was exactly everything I needed. Cause at that point I was just doing passive 360 renders and stuff. And then when I went down there, met like a lot more developers, I got to meet John Carmack, got to hang out with Palmer Lucky. Uh, and then fucking Mark Zuckerberg was there and no one knew he was going to be there. It was like a surprise. So that was, that was interesting. And it, the big mantra, the big mantra that everyone kept talking about was like, these are the, these are the, uh, the good old days. Like you don't know it yet. Right now you're kicking your feet up against the wall and pulling your hair out because we're trying to make these engines that weren't made for VR work in VR. But at some point this is going to be oversaturated. At some point this is going to be like just a standard industry and we will all talk about these years as the good old days. Like when we was like the wild, wild west and you know, like, and they're completely, they were completely right. And uh, I remember Jesse Shell from Shell Games um, did a talk and he was just like saying like, yeah, if you're, if you're with us, if you're going to jump on, into this unknowing void, like, you know, let, let's do it together and let's share your, like these things that we learn. Uh, and it was just like, just recharged like my creative batteries. And I came home like back to Austin, like, you know, um, just like the vengeance and just like was ready to like, that's when I went to a game jam. I was, you know, when people say like, how do you start in VR? Like, what do you got to do? You know, 
I, I tell people if you're going to start a new thing, you got like a new medium or a new industry, like you, you got to throw away your ego because it's not going to translate. Like it's not going to transition. Like when I go to VR events or like game jams, like no one there knows about like my films or my artsy fashion films and music videos. That like when I go to film events, people be like, "Oh, there's JJ. I love your events. We should work together sometime." I, I had none of that. I threw all of that away when I came into VR, and so I remember it was 30 years old. I went to like this game jam, this global game jam at, at UT and it was all like 19 year old kids on laptops. And I came in with like my huge like PC and my Oculus. And I was just like, I just want to make VR. You know? <laughs> and um, there was a group of guys uh, that I found that weren't happy with the teams they were in. I was like, hey, I want to make a VR game. And they were like, oh, okay, we'll do it. Um, and so none of these guys were really known at the time. Um, only one of them, Fox, had kind of worked a little bit with VR and DK2, but it was, uh, I wrangled up this guy named Chris Mahoney, um, who was doing some back-end stuff at Unity at the time. Uh, Fox B uh, Buccelli, who uh, now works at Alchemy, who does you know Job Simulator and, and Rick and Morty, and he worked with me for a bit. And then this guy named Greg Tamargo, uh, who is now my CTO, and none of us had really ever done anything before, and we were just kind of we look at that time and go like, you know, it's funny how many of us like have gone on to like do talks and run companies and do these games and stuff. But, uh, so when I tell people if like, if you're trying to start, if you really want to start, like, you know, you start at the bottom and you, you gotta, you're carrying, you starting at the bottom as being like well-established in an entire other industry, but still walking your happy ass, like six blocks with the fucking computer <laughs> to like UT because you want to meet other game devs, you know? And it's, it's not going to be easy when you start. And when people, when I tell people the same thing, when if like they were a filmmaker and they're working in unity and they're like, Oh, I don't even know how to work in video games, like engines. I'm like, neither did I. And the first week's going to suck. The second week, you're going to remember some things from that first week. Week. The third week things start, you know, and then after a while you're just like, oh, I, I just work in Unity now. Like it's just, it just comes with, um, it just comes with time. Um, and like kind of going back to something you, you, you brought up earlier as like far as my first game, like versus now is I never expected my first VR game to be, you know, like the Citizen Kane of VR. And I think a lot of people have that problem is when they make their first film, you know, they're like, every every second is amazing. You're like, it's two minutes of opening credits, man. Like, it's like, it's a five minute short film. Like, but you're, you're just so excited because it looks like a movie the first time you do it, right? You're like, oh, it looks like a movie. It's hitting way too close to home right, right now. Right, <laughs> And then, but like, and then, and, 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 and then people will be like, it's okay. And you're like, it's perfect. You're an idiot. <laughs> And then you watch it years later and you're like, oh, you know, it's could have been a two minute movie. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but at the time, you're just convinced it's like the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. So I kind of knew that going into VR that my first project and my second project and my third project would be OK, but they wouldn't be like, stop the presses. Did you see what this guy made? I feel totally baseball is is that. I feel totally baseball is something that doesn't exist yet. Takes a lot of ideas of like camera functionalities, broadcast functionalities, Twitch integrations, just an all entertainment like kind of experience. And then it like it's housed in this really cool, really well designed like a, a video game. And I feel like finally I've just kind of been sitting and biding my time and watching the, the industry, seeing what works, what doesn't work, what approaches are working, what kind of hardware people are doing different tricks with. And I now I finally feel, after I've been doing this since 2015, I finally feel like I can make you know, that project that really does make a splash. Um, and so I would just, you know, just be realistic. You know, you, your first project isn't gonna be great, but you're gonna learn a lot from it. So that, that's the advice I would give to people, anyone who wants to jump to filmmaking or game making is like, you know, just know it's gonna take a while before you're at a good spot. That's great, because you, I always ask two questions at the end of the podcast, and the very last one is one that you basically just answered. Oh, it's great. like, how, how would you get to the point where you're at right now, and you basically just answer it. So I'll ask the first one that I normally ask now uh, to cap it off. Sure. Why do you do what you do? I just don't want to be bored in life. Like I said, you only live life once. Uh, and it's so easy to do a job that pays really well, but you hate. And then you blink and 10 years have gone by. And you're like, well, I've got all the toys and TVs and smart house stuff that I could want. I drive a Tesla or whatever. I don't. I'm just saying people that might. Uh, but they're not fulfilled happily, you know? Um, and so what I do, why I do is just because, like, I just... There's no better feeling, whether it's filmmaking, video making, game making, than being like, I have an idea. I'm going to go in this room for a little bit, and then I'm going to come out, and I'm going to give you something, and I'm going to ask you to press play on it. 
and I just want to see how you react to it. Like the fact that this thing didn't exist, this thing, whether it's zeros and ones or celluloid or, or, or film footage or digital footage, like it didn't exist. It was nothing. It was a void until you put something together and now it's this thing. And there's something so, so great and, and, and beautiful about that. And what I realize also for people that have jobs like this or, or, or do what they love is like when they, like when we have parties and stuff, it's pretty tame, right? Like, cause we do what we love already. Like most of the times we're here listening to music and headsets, you know, just there's this energy of like, it's working, it's cool to check this out. And, and so you're constantly happy and excited and, and having a good time. And what I've realized is people that make a lot of money, but have boring jobs like they're the ones that have those like crazy crazy parties where they're like on yachts and loads of drugs and things are awful things are happening just because it's just like they need to get it out of their system because the rest of their life is like really really boring um so when we were in the startup world you know we kept trying to get people kept trying to box us in like oh you should just do realty and it was like no like like this technology just showed up like i don't I, like, stapling yourself right now into one section would be the dumbest thing you could do um, so I've, I've never really lined with like kind of the startup world and the venture capital world. Cause like I've met people and I, and I, I'll talk to them like I'm talking to you right now and they'll just go like, Oh, I see you're an artist. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I'm like, I mean, yeah, guilty. Um, so that, that's kind of my strength and a little bit of my weakness as, as, as far as a CEO. Cause at the end of the day, like, you know, I may invest in some hardware or some toys or some project that, you know. We don't necessarily need to do, but it's, it's important to me to like, you know, I want to try stuff out I want to try, I want to play with mocap. I want to play with spatial capture. There's a lot of stuff that I'm like dipping my toes into, um, that to me in the end, I'm trying to find a way to bring filmmaking into like a VR situation and not just with like standard cameras. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've got some big ideas and I'm, I'm always constantly trying to, uh, like if you like if you if you if you follow me on Twitter, like my pinned tweet, it says like you know I'll never do all the ideas in my head, but you can watch me try. Mm -hmm. And that's how that's a true statement. Love it, love it, man. Well, thank you so much. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, tweeting about all things VR, AR, and movie geekery. I love movies. Uh, it's uh, JJ Castillo VR. Uh, you can check uh, out all our projects and what View Ready is up to on ViewReady.com, and then I think it's uh, View Ready Core. Uh, with a P at the end on, on Twitter. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome. Such a great learning experience. I love learning about these different genres of things on this show because I have so much more of a, like a understanding sure. of what goes on behind the scenes to bring a product to the masses. It's really cool. All right. If you did like this episode and you got value, you know what? You could share it out with a friend. That would be so sweet of you. It'd be great. <laughs> uh, and until next episode, live a life of abundance, and I'll see you guys on the next one.